You created IPython back in 2000, is that right? 2001? 2001. What, what problems were you trying to solve at that point? Um, basically, I was trying to switch. I was a graduate student in physics, finishing my PhD, and I was trying to switch away from using proprietary tools to using open tools. And I was trying to simplify a lot of my workflow uh, from many, many programming languages to using less. And when I discovered Python, I realized that I could replace a lot of different tools with just one language that would make it easier to keep kind of a, a smoother workflow. So you went for making your own thing, right? Yes, but what was missing in Python was a good interactive computing environment. Python has a basic interactive shell, but it doesn't fit the kinds of workflows that you need in scientific computing, where you're, you want to run a script, you want to look at data, you want to plot some variables, you want to change the code a little bit and keep a very exploratory workflow. And so that, and being a grad student looking for an excuse not to work on his dissertation <laughs> <laughs> and instead do something more fun, I was the perfect combination to start uh, writing on Python. Okay. That second part was only part of the real answer, right? Exactly. <laughs> so, so what surprised you about IPython's evolution? The f I guess the fact that precisely something that began as such a simple personal fix for uh, a problem in my own workflow has grown into such a large project. Uh, IPython was actually the first Python program that I ever wrote. And from the looks of it, it's going to be the last that I ever write right. <laughs> because uh, it began as an afternoon hack. And here we are 13 years later, and now it's a fairly large project. And so the fact that we've been able to learn from that one use case of a personal scientific workflow and begin to abstract and abstract away and build an increasingly broad spectrum tool that now serves many other needs, including education, publi uh, publication, scientific computing at, at scale, has been a really surprising and interesting path that something that was born in such a narrow niche has grown uh, both in scope and in a community sense, that the community has been so eager to work with us and adopt it, and the project is now really not my work, but actually the product of, of our, an entire community of people who are more talented than I am yeah. <laughs> and who do all the hard work. How did IPython Notebook come about? That was something that uh, the current iteration that everyone uses is about our sixth attempt at creating a notebook. Is and that right? Yes, we had hmm. five prior prototypes um, of various kinds, um, and uh, that came from tools that existed and that were very widely used in the scientific computing community. I was a heavy user of systems called Maple and Mathematica both of which have notebook-like environments. The Mathematica one is called the notebook and Maple, they call them worksheets, that combine that idea of having text, mathematics, code, and the results of the code all in one document. Mm -hmm. And that's a very natural environment to work in for scientists. So from day one, when I started, when the very first mini script that was IPython 001, which is about 250 lines of code, already has mentions of Mathematica in it, um, and I was a heavy Maple and Mathematica users. So we were after those ideas from early on. Mm -hmm. But neither the technology nor the abstractions nor our own understanding of the problem were ready, and those early five prototypes were missteps. But along the way, we learned many, many things. And eventually, both our capturing of kind of the essential ideas with the framework of the modern web, with taking that notion and moving it over to the browser, um, with a lot of inspiration from a project called Sage, that um, built something similar in 2006 for mathematics mm -hmm. um, kind of took us to the modern notebook. So it was, it was a long road, but where the intention was there from the beginning. And in 2011, Brian Granger, who's my co-PI in, in, in a lot of the project uh, at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo, was able to prototype out what became the current version um, over the course of a summer, um, joining technologies that were just coming out online, um, like uh, WebSockets, like jQuery, like Tornado, and ZeroMQ, uh, which at the time were all very new. Uh, but they kind of fit perfectly. And having tried five times already, we sort of knew exactly what we needed. Um, and so what appears like a very new solution to many people is something that we've actually been working on and thinking about for over 15 years. 15 years. I started using Mathematica in 1994, mm -hmm. and I started using Maple in 1993, maybe. That's quite a timeline. Yes. And so th the uh, the five prototypes, what was the timeline for that? That goes back. Does that go back 15 years, or is that more complex? Those go back, let's see, I think the first one was a Google Summer of Code 2005, I okay. want to say. Um, and uh, the intention was there since the beginning, as I said, but obviously it was too big of a problem for me as a grad student thinking, uh, I want something like that, but there's no way I'm going to do it. So the first cut was just the terminal-based environment, but the first prototype of that was a Summer of Code project in 05, and we had several iterations over the years um, 
all of which dead ended. Interesting. It sounds like eventually it just converged with the way that things were going and you yes. had something that worked. I think it was a combination of those those dead ends were very productive. Yeah. Uh, they showed us all the all the wrong decisions, uh, all the things we shouldn't try to do, and also external technology advances in uh, the JavaScript advances uh, were absolutely critical. Um, the fact that um, tools like Gmail showed everyone that you could build mm -hmm. highly responsive, highly interactive environments in the web uh, that people would be willing to use as day-to-day -day tools. Um, and, and all of the JavaScript technology behind all that made a humongous difference because it was uh, machinery that we could leverage with a really small team to build something that uh, that is actually a, a, a production environment for many scientists today. Interesting. So productive dead ends, right? Very productive dead yeah. ends. So expanding the scope of this a little bit, how much programming do you feel that scientists need to know? It it varies um, quite a bit depending on exactly what we're doing. I think it's important to understand that for scientists, programming has a very different flavor than it does for software developers and software engineers, professional software engineers, in that um, in scientific contexts, by and large, and this is not universal, but by and large, programming is inherently exploratory and iterative, and it's really about answering a question. Programming really is a tool about answering a question. There's a lot of ad hoc code that gets written in, in science, and that's sometimes okay, because it may be that that code that you've written only applies to that particular data set. Mm. So there is no purpose in spending a month designing a massive framework around that to abstract it seven layers deep. It's okay to write one script that mines that data set and extracts the answers that you need. But at the same time, scientists also need to learn how to gradually understand when they do need to abstract mm. a little bit, when that data pattern in that data set is going to be similar in other problems and they should not copy paste that script 50 times, but they should begin moving it into a few functions and having a little library that they use and unit test that library so they can trust it. And so finding a way to operate in that continuum that goes from completely exploratory ad hoc um, work with code or data or an idea or something you read in the paper, all the way to building production tools that are full libraries and that are unit tested and that have regression testing machinery, et cetera, and that creep into the realm of production software engineering um, is, I think, one of the more interesting challenges because it's a different flavor of programming that, uh, that I think is different from what the industry has traditionally seen. And I've had really interesting conversations about this with folks like uh, the Microsoft Visual Studio team uh, who come from the, the heavy-duty professional high-end software engineering tool world um, and f understanding how how there's a this change in perspective about this has, has been has been I think valuable. Somewhat related to this, what's your take on the notion that everyone should learn to code? Um, there's there's the the obvious I, I guess answer to that in, in that uh, yes as the world becomes more computational that's that's useful for many people to know how to code I don't know if everyone but certainly for a lot of people but um, I'd like to take a slight twist on the question which is to ask well why do we code mm. we code because we are trying to communicate to a machine that doesn't have human style natural intelligence how to accomplish a task and in addition to the fact that that means it's a dumb machine. There's also something interesting, I think, in that, in looking at it in, the, in, this, in this form, which is that we code because, in, in coding, we have to clarify to the point that a dumb machine can understand our thought process and what it is that we are going to do. And it means we have to organize the process in a very precise and unambiguous way. We have to perhaps abstract pieces of it so that it can be done by reusing the reusable components, et cetera. And that process of logical, systematic, organized, abstract, computational thought, that I think is a useful, valuable skill in many contexts in life. Being able to think through a problem in a systematic, organized, logical way, understand what parts of the problem are abstractable and generalizable, understand exactly how to accomplish a process that will complete is a useful skill. And so I think there's, there's the act of coding, there's the programming, um, the mechanics of programming and syntax, et cetera, and there's the aspects that are about comp what I would call computational thinking. And I think there's a lot of that which goes into kind of mathematical and scientific thinking that I think is valuable and useful for, I would argue, any human being who lives in a complex world like ours and in a world that has increasingly uh, the presence of 
com of data, of quantitative information that uh, plays into policy making, into decisions that affect every human being in a society. And so I think that mental framework is a valuable one. Last question for you. What people or projects are you following these days? Um, in addition to the obvious uh, people in the kind of scientific Python community, which is the, the, the scope that I move in and the academic research community, I would just highlight perhaps these days uh, that I'm really interested in what the Julia team is doing. Just to highlight one, the, it's a new programming language um, f aimed mainly at technical computing, but with picking up a lot of ideas from, uh, from the recent learning in, in high-level dynamic languages like Python and Ruby. And uh, I love what that team is doing. So. Well, thanks so much for being with us. Appreciate you taking the time. Thank you very much.